This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and now for something a little bit different. We're going to talk about Intel 11th generation, what they call H45 CPUs. These are the H series, yeah, nominally what have been anyway in the past, 45 watt, typically eight core CPUs that we see in gaming laptops and mobile workstations. And uh, Intel sent us a system, and you can see they've self-branded it. See the Intel logo here, it has one on the lid too. Well, what this really is, is an MSI laptop that was made specially for Intel to send to some of us press, our geekier press basically, to test out to see what the performance of Intel 11th gen is like. For those of you who are wondering, because it does say when you look at about this computer and stuff like that, uh, this seems to be the MSI Creator Z16, but this is not a review of this laptop because this is way pre-release at this point, so that's not fair to MSI. This is really about the CPU inside. So what's up with Intel 11th gen? We've already seen Intel 11th gen Ultrabook CPUs on the market. Those are the 15 watt CPUs, and even what they called H35 CPUs that launched at the beginning of 2021, which were four core CPUs running at, well, obviously 35 watts. And those were put in very disparate kinds of laptops. Anything from the premium Vio Z, which was supposed to be a super powerful Ultrabook chassis, to the Asus Tough Line, some of the Asus Tough Line gaming laptops. And there it was sort of more to the affordable and more budget end. But four core CPUs and gaming laptops, not many of us are interested in seeing that anymore, where at least six course has been the standard for three generations now with Intel. So let's talk about the performance, but that's going to get a little complicated. Oh, one more thing. You do get USB 4 and PCIe Gen 4, something again we've seen in other Intel 11th generation. So what does that mean to you? Well, and Thunderbolt 4. There's not a huge difference between Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4, or even USB 3 and USB 4, so that's not earth-shattering, but hey, we'll take it. Uh, with the PCIe 4 versus 3, what does that mean? 20 lanes, and mostly it's going to allow laptop manufacturers, if the chassis has room and it allows to put in more SSD slots because it can address more and has more lanes to do that. And PCIe 4 is faster. So it, a lot of people already really, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a fast PCIe 3 SSD that we've been seeing with really good speed numbers versus 4. But the specific needs of certain content creators where reads and write speeds are really a part of their workflow, a professional video editors, it may above our pay grade, even as professional YouTubers would care about that sort of thing. If for your game loading times and all that sort of thing, will it make earth shattering a difference? No. But again, we'll take it and more lanes is always good, more devices supported. Maybe in the future we'll see wider bandwidth for GPUs and all that. All right, so why is it complicated with this? Because this is a Frankenstein build of the MSI Creator Z16. I, what Intel has done is they've sent the 11th gen HK overclockable 8 core CPU. So in this case for the 11th generation, all of the core i5s, the i7s, and the normal not overclockable i9 are all CTDB of 35 watts. So not 45 watts, which has been the standard. So this is why maybe Intel's not saying H35, H45 so much anymore. So anyway, those are actually potentially using less power. Now the manufacturer has a little leeway this time, so they can take that 35 watt and make it standard to run at 45 watt for its base power consumption. Anyway, but the overclockable CP we have here, the 11980HK, is a 65 watt CTDP. So that's a lot more watts, right? So even though we're down to 10 nanometer with Intel 11th generation, which should mean better power efficiency, better cooling, all that sort of thing, um, it's too much for this chassis. And this thing can run the fan when it's plugged into AC power, just doing things like a crystal disk mark SSD test, which doesn't even really tax the CPU, or just installing software, or just sitting there on the desktop. It's too much CPU for this chassis, which MSI is going to ship with regular i7 and i9s. So that's why I say it's complicated. And the, the GPU on this is an RTX 3060, that's nice, but it's only 65 watts. I have never seen such a lower wattage 3060. So we can't really do gaming benchmark performance on this because there's no other gaming laptop that we reviewed in the past five months that has such a low watt RTX 3000 series 
GPU inside. So we're going to look at primarily CPU tests, a variety of benchmarks, and talk about what those mean. For those of you who are already like, this is way too geeky, what does this, any of this mean to me? Here's the takeaway for this. Yes, it's going to be faster than 10th gen. I, <laughs> no, the thermals are not going to be a whole lot better from what we've seen so far. Though, again, the Core i7 and the Core i9, not overclockable, will run at lower watts, so it'll be a little bit better thermally. This is 10 nanometer until it's finally moved from 14 nanometer they've been using for years, like with Comet Lake, it's still not as efficient a process as what AMD Ryzen has with their 7 nanometer, which is what we see in 2021 and 2020 laptops with AMD inside. All right, let's get into what we've seen in benchmarks and such. Firstly, the graphics in this are Intel UHD. Now they do use XE cores, but way fewer than normal, like 32. So, But this kind of laptop is pretty much always paired with dedicated graphics, be it NVIDIA GeForce or NVIDIA Quadro or AMD's own GPU offering. So that's not too relevant here. So in the benchmarks that we saw, and this is kind of ignoring all of the tests and the propaganda that Intel provided us with for use cases where they know that their machine and their CPU is going to do about the best. Now all manufacturers want to do that sort of thing. So we did our normal set of benchmarks and tests on this. Again, pretty much omitting gaming because the GPU is just way too weak sauce to do that. So what we saw is for some reason, hey, this does great on Geekbench 5, and it even beats the AMD Ryzen 9 5900HX. So this is a win for Intel. And no doubt, this overclockable i9, which probably most people aren't going to buy. They're going to get an i7 or maybe splurge for the i9 not overclockable. But I think this CPU was built pretty much to take on Ryzen and to try to beat them in some of the benchmarks, to be honest. And it might be more fair to compare this with the Ryzen 9 5980H. X, but I haven't seen a laptop on the market with that yet, because that's going to be their top of the line for the i9 competitor. But that said, this did better on Geekbench 5. And not only that, it did better than the previous 10th gen, which we would hope too. So there is a performance improvement here. The, what we're going to see here through most of these tests is anywhere from a 5 to 12% performance boost from Intel 10th generation. Uh, without, again, the thermal improvements that we've seen. Now, as we get into more chassis and all that sort of thing, that might improve. Uh, we use Cooler Boost on this at times, Cooler Boost 5, because that's the MSI feature that maxes out the fans, and this has three fans internally, uh, to see if that helped it with benchmark performance. And really not so much, because even it was still thermal throttling, just not quite as badly. So there's that. Now, if we move on to tests like Cinebench, which some folks think is more representative of real-world demand and performance, in R20, again, it's faster than 10th gen. You can see that on the graph. It hasn't beat AMD Ryzen 9 5900HX. And by the way, for our test systems, as you can see, we're using the ASUS Rogue Strix SCAR 15, and that has a not the Ryzen 9 5900HX. For our, our Core i9HK, we're using an Alienware M17R4, which has a last generation 10980HK CPU. And we're using the Alienware Area 51MR2 with a desktop 10700K overclockable CPU to compare maximal CPU performance Intel 10th gen since 10th and 11th gen desktop CPUs. Not too much performance difference, so that'll be your top baseline. And the times when we're seeing actually this 11th gen beat that CPU, now that's an achievement if and when it does that. So there we go. So anyway, in Cinebench, this still can't be beat Ryzen 9 5900HX. When we for Cinebench R20. When we move to R23, multi-core Ryzen still wins, but and it's interesting because they both have eight cores, 16 threads. But on the single core, this new Intel CPU manages to just eke out a little bit higher score. So the instructions for clock are good here. Given the fact that the clock speeds have dropped a bit from 10th generation, a couple of hundred megahertz typically speaking, that's good to see. So that means that they're doing some things right here with this Intel, definitely. Now we move on to things like Firestrike, and we look at the physics test or the CPU test, to be fair, and ignore the, again, weak sauce GPU that's in here, and Time Spy. There we see it's certainly an improvement from Intel 10th generation, and we see that it's still not beating Ryzen 9 5900HX. Now in real life gaming, as we get more shipping laptops to us, and Intel is going to be sending us a beefier chassis 
more gaming laptop oriented instead of a creator laptop oriented. We can do some more tests and see how it does in actual games with a more respectable GPU that's competitive with other laptops on the market. But it's pretty obvious that games like Far Cry, for example, that franchise just really is optimized for Intel. And Intel always gets a couple more frames versus AMD. So there's going to be a win there. And again, you'll see an improvement from 10 to 12 percent, probably over 10th generation. Uh, for other games that do well on Intel, again, you're going to see more of that uplift. For games that are more GPU heavy, <laughs> obviously the CPU isn't even the most important thing in the equation. I'm talking things like Cyberpunk, for example, very heavy on the GPU. You get the idea there. Oh, and just for giggles, for some of these tests, we threw in the M1 13-inch MacBook Pro just to see how it would do, for example, in Geekbench, because that's a crowd cross-platform test and its single core performance is still well it's the top of the top now if you're going after a windows gaming laptop that's not going to do you any good but it just shows you that some interesting things are happening in cpu land and the technology is improving so i know this is a weird kind of video because this is a pre-release machine with an inappropriately powerful cpu and a very thin chassis that's meant to compete with the 16 inch macbook pro and the weakest NVIDIA RTX 3060 on the market. But one thing we can say after running all of these tests is definitely we're seeing an improvement on our order of average of typically 10% often on a lot of these benchmark tests over Intel 10th generation. And once in a while with this highest tiered CPU that runs at higher watts than all the rest of the 11th gen H mobile CPUs, we even see it beating Ryzen 9 15900HX. And you know what? It's a win. As long as there's competition and both AMD and Intel are working hard to beat each other, it benefits us. So I like to see that. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit the notification bell so you know about them.